what's showing up more and more in the corporate world is the soft skills. But those soft skills are the critical skills to connect with others. And so developing a growth mindset, if you create a safe environment at work, they're much more likely to embrace change. And, and if you're bringing in a lot of change, growth people with growth mindsets love change. They get excited by change. But they're this tiny little piece on the bell curve at the top, you know? The rest of the bell curve is the people who are mm, mostly fixed, but sometimes growth. And then at the bottom of the bell curve, all fixed, full of fear, blame, excuses, all of those sorts of things. So the growth mindset, again, ties into how you care for people, how safe do they feel, and how much do they feel like they belong and they fit in, and that they're valued, that their contribution is actually valued. All of those things, it's almost impossible to have a growth mindset if you're in an unsafe work environment. Welcome to the Beyond Speaking podcast from Premier Speakers Bureau, featuring in-depth conversations with the world's most in-demand keynote speakers. Hi, I'm Brian Lord. This is the Beyond Speaking podcast. Our guest today is Amanda Gore. She's a businesswoman, an award-winning USA Hall of Fame speaker, CEO of The Joy Project. Uh, she's a columnist for the Huffington Post and an author. She works with organizations to reorganize or re-energize and bring joy and engagement back to people, culture, and leadership. So Amanda, thank you so much for uh, being on the Beyond Speaking podcast. Well, thank you for having me, as usual, Brian. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've worked together a, a long time. Um, and by the way, cool accent. Are you from Alabama originally or where? Uh, Texas. I thought you would have picked <laughs> that up straight away. <laughs> I'm, I'm from down under. And, yes. And, you know, you guys at Premier were so fabulous to me when I lived here for about 10 years. And I've just been back for a year. Mm -hmm. And thank you. Thank you for everything you've done for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's great to have you uh, have you back in the states and, and helping out audiences and everything else. I'm curious to know when you. So I book for corporations. When you speak for corporate um, events, is that for wide audiences? Is it mainly for leadership groups? What's kind of your your key demographics when you speak for corporate events? That's a great question. Uh, you know, honestly, Brian, it's across the board because. I don't have a set speech. I have hundreds of chunks of information I can mix and match. So, for example, I did one recently for a bunch of CEO C-suite type people mm -hmm. in uh, ooh, construction or, you know, some pretty um, strong group. And uh, had I talked about what I normally talked about, they would have thought it was way too fluffy. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, I, I coined a new phrase called joy and nomics. Mm -hmm. which is either the value of joy at work or uh, how to make work profitable through joy because there's a stack of research now on how a joyful workplace sells 37% better, is 31% more productive, has 150% less burnout, which is a big issue these days. Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing that I find people are forgetting, so this is this is for everyone, but it's kind of like a leadership group or a management group as well, is that we forget we're we're dealing with humans. Mm -hmm. Business isn't about B two B and B two C. They're all elements, of course, but really it's H to H. It's human to human. Like when you're a leader, who are you leading? Humans. Yeah. And most, you know, if you're selling, who are you selling to? Humans. So they're principles that go across the board, but can be malleable uh, to integrate the content that's suitable for that particular group. And, and quite often they'll use me to kickstart an event mm -hmm. because I spent, tell me if I'm rabbiting on too long. Oh, go uh, for it. Yeah, keep going. I spent 35 years studying group dynamics with Michael Grinder. So I, I learned that there is a very big difference between the content that you present, which obviously has to be relevant, appropriate, up to date, and the process by which you deliver it. And the process is the magic that makes it memorable and, and changes the event. Because when you can get everybody interacting and engaged in a presentation, which is what I focus on, and you give them great content, and you give them basically a new language to use for the rest of the event, by the time they've finished, they've left their stress behind them, and they're ready to learn, their hearts are open to learn, and they're already connected. Mm -hmm. and those are important things too in uh, in. Um, any event, but in the corporate world today, after COVID, people are so disconnected. Mm -hmm. 
They How can did people that. reconnect? Uh, you know, so you mentioned that. So how can people reconnect now after COVID this, for this H to H? Well, he said, you know, I wish I could say, well, this is rocket science. But uh, in fact, I blend epigenetics, emotional intelligence, neuroscience and quantum physics because I've studied it since I was 17. Hmm. It was a long time ago. Uh, and if you, if you look at the sciences, almost all of them and in Harvard Business Review, this is what they write about, is about self-awareness and about your ability to care for others. Mm -hmm. And there's a company called Barry Waymiller that has a fabulous leadership philosophy, which is where they they treat everyone in the organisation as if it is someone else's precious child. So the way to connect with people is to actually care. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do blend sciences, but it's not rocket science. <laughs> Think about the best leader you ever had. Of course, mm -hmm. it's you in your case, Brian. Everybody <laughs> in the organisation would say that. But, you know, think of the best leader you had. It wasn't somebody who said to you, go for this KPI, which will cross you as you're doing it. No, you'll be able to do it. It's the person that you knew cared for you and was willing to help you grow and develop. So though, and spending time together is the other big thing in terms of connection mm -hmm. because we all carry, we have a magnetic field around us, and this is all science-based, and the heart field goes six feet out in a sphere from the body. And when you're interacting with someone else's heart field, so two magnetic fields interacting, then an even more powerful connection comes through. But we can do it online too if we've got hybrid workplaces by just genuinely caring for people. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I love that. So um, you know, with the term joy, because that's that's obviously a big thing. Can you define that for us and what got you started into focusing on joy? Well, again, I would love to have some spectacularly focused story, but all I can say to you, Brian, is that maybe 15 years ago, I woke up one day and I knew I had to write a book on joy. Hmm. I'm like, what do I know about joy? I was miserable at the time. And <laughs> so I did a great deal of work on myself and I kept trying to write the book and eventually I got the book written in a most unusual way, but I got it written. And then everything just in my speaking seemed to move in that direction mm -hmm. because it's it's a foundational point, really. And again, it's not rocket science, but we become so sophisticated in the business world and everything has to sound great and fancy and all that stuff, but we forget we're dealing with humans. Mm -hmm. And honestly, most humans are toddlers walking around in grown-up bodies. And the, the reason the joy kind of stuck is that I could see how it related, particularly with the research that was being done, mm -hmm. to every aspect of, of a company, whether it's sales, customer service, leadership, the, anything, culture. If you can build a joyful culture, there's an enormous reduction in um, staff turnover mm -hmm. and complaints and all that sort of thing. So it really affects the bottom line. And, and to me, Joy isn't wandering around going, well, life's great every five seconds. For me, it's actually, and the last chapter of the book is inner peace. Mm. It was called equanimity, but nobody knew what that meant, so I had to change it to inner peace. <laughs> um, but, but that's the kind of thing that summons it up. And I, and I guess if I could make that even more succinct, for me, the real source to joy is that you feel good about yourself. Mm -hmm. And I teach that the most important thing in life is how you feel about yourself because that influences everything. Mm -hmm. you know, think, think of a day where you celebrated a lot the night before and you're a touch hungover. Well, how effective are you that day? And, and if you're carrying around one of the three core fears that are core unconscious drivers, which almost everybody does, then every day you are triggered into a state of defensiveness or not behaving as well as you could or performing as well as you could because those fears have reflexively kicked in. Hmm. So I'm not making it sound very scientific, but it's actually pretty scientific and it's provable and it works. You know, it's pretty simple to say people who are happy at work, stay there. Mm -hmm. how, how are, what are some of the ways that someone can start building a culture of joy at their work? Well, one of the core tenets is to make it fear-free. Mm -hmm. You know, there are still leaders who think that a fear-based environment is going to drive people to be their best. No, it's not, because they're already carrying plenty of fears themselves. So 
Uh, number one is to try to make it fear free. And then actually, my ex husband was, we're great friends, was one of the most brilliant leaders I've ever met. And he was a master of connecting heart to heart with people. Hmm. And he would once a month, he would go off and have a coffee chat with them. But they all knew that the coffee chat was really a happiness chat. That's what I coined them. And and he would have a happiness chat with people once every month or two months and find out what was going well and what wasn't. Mm -hmm. And that was just genius in how he achieved so many things with that one little meeting. People felt cared for. They felt heard. He learned more about what was going on in the organisation at the grassroots. He could facilitate things in a different way. So that's another way where you facilitate ways for people to feel that you care. Another is to bring in the concept of celebration on a very conscious level. So celebrating small changes and and the way that I play with that, because, you know, we have to be entertaining as we present. I could stand there and be desperately serious, but people would be bored stupid. So it's better to tell a story, be a bit funny, but have a profound message behind it. And um, I talk about doing tadas because when you have a little kid, as soon as they learn how to do something, grown-ups teach them to say ta-da. And when somebody goes ta-da to a little kid, all the grown-ups go, yay. You know, they just peed the first time, yay, ta-da. <laughs> and so they run around doing tadas everywhere. Well, inside, remember, we're still the toddlers. So you could institute a tada culture where Simple little things like, you know, you get a glass fish bowl and and you encourage the team to notice other people doing things that are great, that deserve a ta-da. Mm -hmm. And they put their names into the bowl. And at the end of the week, the leader pulls out a name and acknowledges Frank because he did a wonderful job or Susie because she did something. They are really small but significant things because if the most important thing in life is how you feel about yourself, the number one thing that people want is acknowledgement and recognition. Mm -hmm. And we all know that. It's like a, a proven fact, but people don't do it. Now, they might take them away on an incentive trip that costs $5 billion or, I don't know, somebody wins a car. That's awesome. And if you do it on a day-to-day -day basis, then it changes the nature of the culture. And because the leader is the one creating that culture and influencing it significantly, how the leader feels about themselves and what simple little things like this they implement, happiness chats, tadas, conscious connecting moments, those mm. sorts of things. It's not, again, it's not rocket science. It's just bringing humanity back into business. Mm -hmm. What are some of the ways that you can do the opposite? So obviously, other than saying, just do, do the wrong thing here, but what are some of the killers of joy maybe that, that leaders don't even think they're doing? Oh, well, let me draw you a little diagram. It'll be a bit dodgy on this, but it'll help. My, I studied, the man I studied the nonverbal communication, the group dynamics with, was Michael Grinder. He's a master of nonverbal communication. And he gave me permission to use this. So can you see the three little chairs? Mm -hmm. So in the front chair is the behavior that you want to change in a person because part of a leader's job is to change people's behavior. Behind the chair, I'll just write them all out now, behind that behavior chair is a fear chair, and behind that is a need. So if you identify the fear that's driving people's behaviour, you feel the need to eradicate that fear, you'll change the behaviour. Hmm. And so the joy killers are the fears. Hmm. And the three core fears are I'm not good enough or I'm not worth loving. The second is I'm unsafe in some way. And you see how those both tie into the current cultures in workplaces mm -hmm. where people are, I mean, the, the global culture is I'm unsafe. And mm -hmm. then if we have that at work as well, and that's why all the mental health issues have come up at work and psychological safety is such a big deal. Mm -hmm. And the third core fear is a sense of separation. I don't belong. I don't fit in. And understanding those three joy killers allows you to then look at every person in your team or every colleague you have, work out which one that might be operating in that person, and then you can look at the need, which will help reduce the fear, which then changes the behaviour. Hmm. So the joy killers are the fears. Yeah, that's interesting because we all carry it, as you mentioned. I mean, that's something that's, that is that is certainly cutting out both at work, home, everywhere else. That's, that's obviously a, a huge deal. 
Um, what are, um, so you're switching from that. How can you help someone have more of a, uh, like a growth mindset when it comes to work or helping, helping develop that in others? Can I come back to that, Brian? Because yes. Because just something quickly. Okay. I know you've got children. Yes. So one of the key things as a parent, and I try to link all of the stuff that I teach to people's home lives as well, mm-hmm. because if you can influence their home lives with change, they will change more at work. Mm-hmm. Um, the goal of a parent really is to help a child leave home feeling good about themselves, which means talk to the children about those three core fears and uh, have open discussions about it because we know from epigenetics those fears are embedded by the time we're seven. So if you've got a zero to seven, you've got a chance of unembedding. If they're past seven, have the conscious conversation and then reinforce for the child that they are worth loving, they are good enough, and you're and that they are safe and that they always belong. They, they sound simple things, but they're not often used. And that actually ties into the growth mindset because a fixed mindset is in someone who's riddled with fear. A growth mindset is someone who feels good about themselves, that does practice self-care, that does have self-awareness, that is emotionally intelligent. Mm -hmm. So, again, you can see that what's showing up more and more in the corporate world is the soft skills, but those soft skills are the critical skills to connect with others. And so developing a growth mindset, if you create a safe environment at work, they're much more likely to embrace change. And, and if you're bringing in a lot of change, growth people with growth mindsets love change. They get excited by change. But they're this tiny little piece on the bell curve at the top, you know. The rest of the bell curve is the people who are mm, mostly fixed but sometimes growth, and then at the bottom of the bell curve, all fixed, full of fear, blame, excuses, all of those sorts of things. So the growth mindset, again, ties into how you care for people, how safe do they feel, and how much do they feel like they belong and they fit in and that they're valued, that their contribution is actually valued. All of those things, it's almost impossible to have a growth mindset if you're in an unsafe work environment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that, that is one of those things. That it, it's uh, tough to build, but very good once you have it. Um, so one of the things, too, I know that if we're talking to event planners here. Um, how, what can an event planner say to someone on her committee or, or an executive uh, that says topics like joy are just fluff, not uh, something that are fit for business? Well, I've, I've had that question a few times, Brian. Well, first of all, I think the statistics are pretty impressive that you sell 37% more, you have 31% more productivity, 150% less burnout. I think there's something like 83%, uh, no, that's some astonishing figure, like 83% of people say the boss is the most stressful thing at work. Um, But there's a reduction of turnover by something like 65%, I think. So first of all, this joynomics, if you like, that there are statistics out there showing that joyful workplaces are much more profitable and much more effective. But the second reason is that I think if a meeting planner was looking at the importance of emotional intelligence, which has gone through waves, peaks and waves in the corporate world, but the bottom line is it's critical because, again, we're dealing with humans. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that joy really does matter for the bottom line. It's been shown to transform a culture. And a pretty simple statement is, well, happy people stay in the one workplace. And Mm -hmm. people don't leave jobs. They leave bosses. Mm -hmm. That is another, you know, line that's everybody goes, oh, yeah, that's true. But we don't pay attention to that. So teaching leaders how to incorporate some of the principles of joy. But remember that the whole presentation isn't just about joy. It's really about how people can feel good about themselves. And that influences everything that goes on. So it kind of ties into what the meeting planner wants to achieve from the meeting or what he or she's been given as the goal for the event and for the session. And, And the other thing is to consider that I would say to people, if you look at the group process, not just the content, that's what really matters. So if you're looking for a keynote experience or a workshop experience where people actually change and they 
lose the stress, they lighten up, but they're learning stuff and they're interacting with each other all the time. All of that creates an experience that transforms what's going on and makes the event memorable and kickstarts you on a high or finishes you on a high. So it's it's kind of a blend. It's not just the joy, but it's the joy plus or the concept of joy plus the interaction plus the creating the experience plus the process plus I'm easy to work with. <laughs> that's good. That's that's very true. Uh, I know, and we've always gotten that from from event planners who've who've had you in the past, and and just the humor that goes with it. I know that's one of those things that you never be like be funny like when you're doing an interview, but that just so for people watching and listening. You know there is a lot of, of humor to Amanda's presentation, um, and uh, and something that that is a lot of fun and actually brings that brings that joy with it. So, all right, so Amanda, if you are a quantum physics person, you've been studying since you were seventeen. Uh, what do you think of Marvel and their use of quantum physics and making everything quantum in uh, in the Marvel universe? Wow. Well, there's their quantum and other quantum. And okay. and I have to I have to say I'm not a huge watcher of Marvel movies. Okay. Okay. However, I've seen a couple of bits and pieces here and there, and it's so interesting, Brian, because people don't think quantum physics applies to anything except woo woo wacky out space type things. But the bottom line is, it's the proof that we're all connected all the time. Hmm. And I, I like to use a simple example that's you know you haven't heard from Mary for three months, five months, and you used to talk every week. And you suddenly think, wow, I haven't heard from Mary. What happens the next day? Oh, Mary gives you a call. Mary Mary calls you. And and we are connected like that all the time. And one that, oh, I wish I had my sparkly bits here with me. But one of the things I speak about when I'm talking about communication is that we all walk around with invisible fishbowls on our heads. And in the fishbowls are my sparkly bits. And my sparkly bits and your sparkly bits talk to each other all the time. Hmm. And what's coming out of my mouth doesn't match what's coming out of my sparkly bits. Guess what you pick up always? Just that vibe or whatever. Sparkly bits. So what I have, uh, because that's one of the other things I do, I have symbols. People don't remember words. They remember symbols. So I have, I'm packing to move house, so I haven't got anything (laughs) around me at the moment. But I have a big set of heart-shaped glasses, which are my gratitude glasses, which people kill to get to remind them to look at the world with gratitude. But I have these headbands with sparkly, shiny pom-pom things on the end, like cheerleader things. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll put them on and I'll say these sparkly bits are the most important thing anyone will ever teach about communicating because they are. Mm. And think about it, your least favourite person walks into the room or you're going to have a Zoom meeting with them or some other digital form of connection. And, and if you're really honest, you, you're not sitting there saying to yourself, Fabulous, fabulous. Here's an opportunity to practice forgiveness, compassion, and love. No, you're not thinking that. You're thinking, <laughs> oh, no, die now, die now. Oh, not today, not today. But your mouth goes, hi. And the problem <laughs> is they hear everything. So in quantum world, that that's another example of it as well. But I'm sorry I can't directly um, address the Marvin question. If you want to give me a specific thing, I could talk to it. Uh, well, I don't know that anything off the top of my head, but whenever I think of that, that's um, like I've read up about it and, and different things and, and where that comes in. And it's uh, to me, it's interesting. So if you do check out Marvel, because it's that's again, that's too big a question for that. But uh, but uh, yeah, I, I appreciate it. Thanks for thanks for sharing that bit of quantum uh, quantum physics that most of us probably quantum don't. Quantum communication. Quantum mm-hmm. communication. I like it. Well, oh, one of the jokes. We have a new topic. It, I know. I know. We should put it in there, and that that will really click for all the sci-fi fans. But that is that's one of the jokes in there. Is this guy who's an outsider is talking to scientists, and he goes, "Do you just put quantum in front of everything?" So that's one of his, <laughs> one of his jokes. And so uh, anyway, so Paul Rudd has that's his joke. So we, maybe we I'll channel that, that in. Um, so Amanda, thank you so much for coming on and uh, being part of the Beyond Speaking podcast. And uh, for those watching, listening, uh, you can go to premierspeakers.com and uh, check out Amanda Gore's information there, videos, bio, speech topics, everything else. And of course, with the speech topics, she customizes everything uh, for you. So Amanda, once again, thank you so much for being part of the Beyond Speaking podcast. You're so sweet. Thank you, Brian, for having me. And I know everybody says that they customize, but I actually really do.
<laughs> That's good. And Premier are great. They're a oh. wonderful bureau. Lots of wonderful people. And I'm not saying that just to suck up. I've known you <laughs> for a very long time and I love you all. Oh, well, thank you so much, man. We appreciate it. Thank you for joining us for the Beyond Speaking podcast. To learn more about today's guests, visit premierspeakers.com. Make sure to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen.